Okay, thank you for coming. I think we can open uh, this uh, parallel session on uh, <clears throat> the conflict dynamics and security cooperation in East Asia. I am Benjamin Haute Couverture from uh, the Fondation for la Recherche Stratégique, Foundation for Strategic uh, Research in France, uh, which is a part of that, uh, of that consortium and uh, very happy to be with uh, you today. We were sorry to hear uh, the, 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 the day before yesterday that our good colleague uh, <clears throat> uh, Gudrun uh, Walker from uh, SWP Berlin would uh, not be able to, to join us uh, today for health reasons. So our panel therefore comprises uh, three speakers. Uh, Madame l'Ambassadeur Gorelli, uh, permanent uh, representative of Australia to the United Nations uh, and to the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador, to be with us today. Um, uh, pres the, um, Professor Hideshi Tokushi, uh, who is the president of the Research Institute for Peace and Security in Tokyo, and uh, our good friend Tongfi Kim, the Dr. Kim, is a senior researcher at the Brussels School of Governance here. Uh, so, Tongfi Kim, you will be the first speaker. You will address Japanese, North Korean, and uh, South Korean nuclear weapons discourse speech after February 2022 based especially on your co-authored um, uh, article, paper you, 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 you wrote with uh, Du Yung Lee at the University of Oslo. It's a comparison of the three governments and, and public's reactions to Russia's war against uh, Ukraine. Ambassador Gorelli, you will address uh, Australia's contribution to strategic uh, balance equilibrium in the uh, Indo-Pacific. And Professor Takushi, you will discuss the possibility of further EU-Japan maritime security cooperation focusing on the South China Sea. And uh, since we have some, some time, we will have three speakers rather than four. I'd like to start by uh, noting that the title of our session goes well beyond the non-proliferation and disarmament realm uh, issues that may arise in the region. For a long time, for those who are not very familiar with uh, our annual uh, conference, as part of this uh, format, we have sought to uh, mostly to understand the issue of North Korean proliferation in its uh, last decade, of course. And uh, in this respect, it uh, has uh, often been said that the European Union, after the, let's say, uh, rather painful experience uh, of Kido at the turn of the last century, the Korean Economic Development Organization, of course, uh, had been um, somehow a bystander uh, in this affair, uh, if we put aside, of course, the implementation of a systematic uh, policy of sanctions, but uh, the, the trade with North Korea is such that, of course, the effectivity is not uh, very uh, <coughs> uh, notable. Uh, now the issue, of course, is far more complex, although it was never simple, of course, but. The rate of increase in China's arsenal is uh, open to debate, but the trend will definitely not be downwards uh, over the next uh, decade. Ultimately, it can be said that the nuclear uh, umbrella is one of the elements of the United States security guarantee of Japan and, and the Republic of Korea. It's part of multi dimensional alliances that use a variety of tools to demonstrate commitment to, to prepare uh, a response uh, in the event of deterrence failure. 
The nuclear umbrella itself is a complex mix of security guarantees, political signaling, and of course, a very strong non-proliferation instrument that forms part of the, the regional security architecture in Asia. And in addition, the, the desire to strengthen extended deterrence in Asia puts crisis or puts uh, attacks of a conventional nature really back at the center of the debate nowadays. Most contemporary analysis considers that the main strategic risk arises from the potential escalation of conventional conflicts. The uh, idea that conventional uh, warfare strategies have become more of uh, a factor of nuclear instability in, in East Asia that would be, let's say, the, the disruption of the nuclear balance between the United States and its adversaries is now well documented in, in literature and in this respect. Some American analysts believe that Washington's attempt to respond to its uh, Asian allies growing demand for nuclear reassurance unnecessary feeds or even counterproductively the argument that the conventional component of deterrence is not functional, does not work. And at the same time, the rapid construction uh, the consolidation, the diversification of Chinese, of North Korean arsenals, nuclear capabilities, ballistic capabilities, is weakening year after year because this is the reality. The credibility of a U.S. nuclear response in a scenario of military escalation in Northeast Asia. So uh, what's the point then? Whatever the modalities, the issue of extended deterrence has once again become very acute the, the last 10 years as the, let's say, only uh, real alternative to uh, the temptation to launch national deterrent programs. And of course, the Ukrainian president feeds the advocates of uh, such uh, an approach. And the feverishness also extends as far as uh, Australia sometimes. And the question of an increase in China's arsenal is bound to have repercussions uh, on India's nuclear policy and therefore on the strategic triangle with Pakistan. So, the regional strategic equation has become a resolutely complex one, I mean, properly. With the reappearance of Cold War concepts, such as the risk of strategic imbalance, uh, the dynamics of uh, action-reaction following new perceptions of uh, security dilemmas, and these dynamics are likely to relaunch, at least theor theoretically, arms races against which risk reduction measures and policies alone will certainly be uh, not enough, will be insufficient as tools for resolving those uh, strategic competitions. So in this context, uh, we uh, European First, uh, always need to understand what is going on, if only to avoid, let's say, uh, repeating the bad experience of our participation in Kido uh, 25 years ago, for instance, uh, which was a pretty bad souvenir. 
And uh, our session this morning, uh, among other occasions, of course, allows uh, us to do just that. So uh, we have, um, we have, let's say, we said around 12 minutes per speaker, and we will start with you, uh, Dr. Kim. The floor is yours, and I, and I think you don't have slides to support your presentation. Okay, good, let's go. Thank you, Benjamin. Um, I hope uh, you can all hear me well. <coughs> um, as uh, Benjamin just said, um, the panel is more than uh, nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament, um, and I actually work on uh, many other geopolitical issues, but uh, I'm currently working on a paper with uh, Doyon Lee at the University of Oslo on um, the issue of, I guess, nuclear weapons discourse. So I thought, given the nature of the conference, it would be good to um, yeah, present uh, something based on our uh, paper. Uh, uh, having said that, uh, I'm more of an expert on military alliances, and Doyon is the expert on nuclear weapons. So if you have any questions uh, that I cannot uh, answer well, um, I will be very happy to introduce you to him. Um, OK. Are you okay with the echo? Um, because there is an echo. Can you yeah. can you can you hear it? Yes. Yeah, can, it I, can, can we do something with this? It's not too bad. No. I, and <laughs> what do you think? What do you think? I'm okay, but can you hear me well and understand me well? Okay. Good. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about nuclear weapons discourse and some policy changes in uh, Japan, North Korea, and South Korea. These are obviously very far away from Europe and from Ukraine, but um, I'm not going to talk about the causal relationship uh, that explicitly because when it comes to countries like North Korea, it's very hard to yeah, pinpoint. But uh, I think you will probably get what, I'm, what we are getting at uh, by the end of uh, my talk. Um, let me start with Japan. Uh, which underwent the least significant uh, changes after the Russo-Ukrainian uh, war this round uh, from February 20 to, uh, 2022 uh, began. So three days after the invasion began, uh, the former Prime Minister uh, Abe Shinzo uh, remarked on TV that uh, discussion of nuclear sharing with the United States. Uh, by this, uh, he, me he meant deploying U.S. nuclear weapons in Japan and jointly operating them. And uh, he said, this discussion of nuclear sharing should be not seen as a taboo anymore. Uh, his position was also supported by Nippon Nishin, uh, which is a conservative opposition party in Japan. And initially, the public's reaction to Abe's statement was actually not so clear. Um, and depending on how you asked a question, the support level for Abe's position would vary from somewhere between 20% uh, yeah, to 57%. Uh, uh, but uh, both anti-nuclear norms uh, among the political elite, policymakers, and also practical strategic considerations uh, kept Japan from shifting its nuclear discourse and policy. First, at the national diet, the Japanese parliament, the day after Abe's statement, uh, Prime Minister uh, Kishida Fumio uh, dismissed Abe's remark, um, saying that nuclear sharing is unacceptable from Japan's standpoint of adhering to the three non-nuclear principles. It's uh, worth noting that nuclear disarmament uh, has been an important political agenda for Kishida, and um, his electoral di uh, district is in Hiroshima, so no wonder. Uh, second, uh, on March 16th, uh, 2022, the ruling Liberal Democratic Party held a study meeting and concluded that nuclear sharing does not fit Japan's security interest. Uh, so um, nuclear sharing was not included in the uh, Japanese government's proposal for the national security strategy, which was later released in December 2022. Overall, the vast majority of uh, both politicians and experts seem to think that the U.S. extended nuclear deterrence for Japan is working really well, and deploying nuclear weapons in Japan just unnecessarily increases um, the risk of attacks against Japan. 
And asking for nuclear sharing could also complicate uh, the relationship between Tokyo and Washington because the US government at the moment at least is reluctant to do so. It may be possible to um, explain the continuity of Japanese nuclear weapons discourse just by referring to the strong uh, historical anti-nuclear norms in Japan. But um, it's also very important to uh, consider these practical strategic considerations. In the context of US extended uh, deterrence for Japan, nuclear weapons are unrealistically uh, far away from the likely level of the escalation ladder, and deploying nuclear weapons in Japan uh, can unnecessarily uh, introduce new military risks. So in contrast to Japan, uh, Japan has preferred a US offshore nuclear umbrella that relies on um, over the horizon or under the water uh, American strategic nuclear assets. Now let me talk about North Korea, uh, which arguably experienced the most important shift uh, uh, in its nuclear weapons discourse and policy. And this change in North Korea also affected uh, South Korea's uh, discourse. Simply put, after the uh, Russo-Ukrainian war began, uh, Pyongyang adopted a um, dual track strategy uh, for both the deterrent and offensive use of its nuclear weapons. Traditionally, North Korea has maintained this uh, uh, assured retaliation strategy. So the main purpose or even exclusive purpose of its nuclear arsenal was to deter the United States from attacking North Korea. Um, but now at the same time, Pyongyang uh, is uh, adopting an asymmetric escalation strategy. And this strategy encompasses uh, three core characteristics. First, um, the threat of the first use of nuclear weapons. Second, the pre-delegation of authority to use nuclear weapons to field commanders. And third, the development of various uh, nuclear delivery platforms, including tactical nuclear weapons. Um, after the war began, North Korea has made significant advancements in all three aspects. Uh, Kim Jong-un already in April 2022 uh, indicated that uh, North Korean nuclear weapons may be used for goals other than deterring a war. And in September 2022, uh, North Korea enacted a new nuclear doctrine uh, in the form of a law on DPRK's policy on nuclear forces. This new law marks a departure from uh, North Korea's previous last resort uh, stance and opens the possibility of using nuclear weapons first in conventional warfare on the Korean Peninsula. Regarding the delegation of authority to uh, use nuclear weapons, uh, the 2022 law uh, for the first time specified that a nuclear strike shall be launched automatically and immediately according to an operation plan decided in advance if the leader's command and control is placed in danger owing to an attack by hostile forces. Finally, uh, before the Russo-Ukrainian war, North Korea did not publicly emphasize the necessity of developing tactical nuclear weapons and nuclear operational planning for battlefield operations uh, within the Korean theater. Uh, Pyongyang used to focus on just the development and sophistication of strategic nuclear weapons because that was the most important thing, to deter the United States from attacking the, uh, attacking the regime. Uh, but on New Year's Day 2023, uh, Kim Jong-un emphasized the importance of mass producing tactical nuclear weapons uh, targeting South Korea. In March 2023, uh, North Korea publicly unveiled a Fasan 31 uh, tactical nuclear warhead and in recent months, uh, North Korea has been conducting a series of uh, uh, simulated uh, tactical nuclear attacks on South Korea. Now, uh, finally, uh, these changes in North Korea's nuclear weapons discourse naturally prompted uh, reactions on the part of South Korea. The conservative uh, Yoon son yeol administration came to power in May 2022 uh, with a more hawkish stance uh, toward North Korea than its predecessor, the Moon Jae-in administration. The preference of the current South Korean uh, government and the uh, traditionally strong um, support for nuclear weapons options in the South Korean public opinion definitely matter. 
So these are the permissive conditions. But the Russo-Ukrainian will probably indirectly uh, affected South Korea's nuclear weapons discourse through the changes in the North Korean nuclear doctrine that I just mentioned. As a reaction to North Korea's policy shift that increased the possibility of uh, nuclear weapons used by North Korea, uh, South Korea has um, first uh, bolstered its conventional deterrent capabilities uh, against North Korea, second, secured more robust U.S. extended deterrence for, an uh, uh, sorry, for uh, South Korea. And third, um, South Korea also experienced a um, higher level of support for an indigenous nuclear arsenal. In reaction to the new North Korean nuclear doctrine, South Korea has taken steps to strengthen its um, conventional preemptive strike capabilities in the form of its uh, kill chain system, so part of the so-called uh, three-axis system, and so recently introduced the concept of kill web uh, to expedite the decision-making process for preemptive strikes. In April 2023, South Korea's Navy also initiated a project to build three joint fire ships with over 80 ballistic missiles, which have been, these ships had been previously been in the conceptual stage, but now the development has really started. South Korea has also been seeking stronger extended deterrence commitment from the United States. Um, and um, by the way, because I'm based in Brussels and I also um, part-time part work for the Korea chair, um, I meet a lot of uh, Korean visitors. Um, and after the Yoon Son Yeon administration uh, uh, started, uh, a lot of Korean visitors asked us about uh, what we think of uh, South Korea going nuclear. And uh, we saw a lot of trial balloons about South Korea's indigenous nuclear arsenal. And I, I guess uh, it never really worked. So, so uh, I think um, this option is clearly unpopular outside South Korea. And the uh, Yoon Son Yeon administration now seems to be satisfied with um, the current arrangement uh, it uh, ended up having uh, with the United States. Uh, in the form of the Washington uh, Declaration, adopted in uh, April 2023. Uh, through the Washington Declaration, uh, the United States committed to two main things. Uh, first, uh, establishing a nuclear consultative group to enable the alliance's joint execution and planning for U.S. nuclear operations in military contingencies. And second, uh, enhancing the regular uh, uh, visibility of American strategic assets to the Korean Peninsula. Um, militarily, they don't make sense. Uh, I think it's just a photo of kind of uh, just a show, but uh, still, it seems to be important uh, politically and because that sometimes is reassuring to the public. And um, after the Washington Declaration, I think the, especially among the supporters of the uh, current conservative government, uh, the South Korean public seemed to have been reassured and the support level for indigenous nuclear option decreased a little bit. But I think the talk of indigenous nuclear uh, arsenal will not disappear in South Korea because the underlying public support uh, for this option is quite high. In January 2023, uh, in South Korea, 76.6% uh, of the public supported the development of uh, nuclear weapons. And that was 17% uh, 17 increase from a similar poll conducted six years ago, which may have been due to the uh, Russo-Ukrainian war. And another poll in April, and uh, that was collected in April and May, that has a, yeah, slightly reduced uh, level of support for indigenous uh, nuclear options because Yun Son supporters were told that, that the Washington Declaration does uh, what independent uh, nuclear option was supposed to do. But even then, over 60% of South Koreans still support an independent indigenous uh, nuclear option. So I think this will come back uh, in the future. Uh, I will stop here. Thank you. Merci, merci Tong Fi. Thank you very much, uh, Tong Fi, and uh, for addressing in particular the Washington Declaration, and to introduce the the, the, the South Korean landscape, let's say. But maybe you will, uh, in the Q and A session, have uh, time to uh, 
address a little bit that uh, nuclear consultative group which was introduced in the declaration and what to, and, and just in order for us to know what you think of the initiative, you know. And, 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 and we would like to know if you are among those who believe that extended deterrence, in particular through that new mechanism, is being threatened in South Korea uh, or not. What do you think of this? Uh, another point you raised, which was very, of course, uh, uh, critical, is the question of nuclear sharing, which was uh, raised uh, as far as Japan is, is concerned. Uh, we know, of course, the disarmament agenda of, of, of the current uh, prime minister, but we uh, also know that uh, Fumio Kishida mandate soon comes to an end. So what are the options for the future? And, and certainly Professor uh, Takushi would like to add a word on this, even though your subject, Professor, is different. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, I will give the floor directly to you, Amanda, for another point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benjamin, and thank you so much for inviting an Australian to an EU conference. Um, I was in a taxi yesterday here in Brussels, and, you know, as is usually the case, taxi drivers ask you questions about where you're from. And he said to me, are you British? And I said, no, I'm Australian. And he said, so do you have a British accent? And I said, no, I've got an Australian accent. And he said, so is that like an American accent? And I said, no, it's a very distinctive Australian accent. And he said... So Australia was um, colonised by the British. I feel like I can talk about the British now. They're no longer part of the EU. Um, but um, he said Australia was colonised by the British, right? And I said, yes, that's correct. Um, but we're an you know, independent, <coughs> sovereign country now. Um, and he said... And then I said, but we still have the royal monarch as the head of state. And he said, what? Why? <laughs> and I said, I agree. I don't know why. <laughs> um, but it's symbolic. And he said to me, yes, and I'm sure they still want to keep you as an ally. And so I thought, yeah, yeah, no, he's probably right. But it's really a question for Australia as to whether or not we remain as um, having the royals as the head of state. Um, but we are indeed um, allies. Um, and so, I mean, I guess that's a, a, a humorous way of saying Australia is a very long way away from Europe. Um, and I always um, feel that very much so in Geneva where I'm based and while Australia um, and Japan and Korea all have, um, you know, strong representation there, it's very, very patchy when you um, get down to the Pacific Island states, for instance. Um, often they're not represented there at all or if they are, they also cover Brussels and a whole lot of other countries as well. So it's good to have um, an opportunity um, for, to have a voice um, from our region. And, um, you know, we're also very close to um, the EU and NATO. Um, in fact, our um, strategic dialogue is taking place this week here in Brussels. So um, that's just an indication of the strength of our relationship. So Australia is committed to a world where sovereignty and international law um, are respected and, and that is a steadfast commitment of ours and we'll continue to work with partners and all countries really to uphold these values, be it in the Indo-Pacific or here in the Euro-Atlantic. And Australia, you know, demonstrates our commitment to this region um, as one of the largest non-NATO contributors to the conflict in Ukraine. Um, we've demonstrated that we are um, ready, willing and able to stand up for those values um, when they are infringed here in Europe. And likewise... Um, we think European partners have an important role to play in the Indo-Pacific. Um, the future of Europe is in some ways being forged by developments that take place in um, our region as well. And we do value the contribution of European partners through their presence in the Indo-Pacific region. I mean, France is a Pacific power, but there's also um, lots of other... Um, efforts that are taking place um, to contribute to peace and security in the Indo-Pacific, including promoting adherence to international law um, and um, law of the sea convention, um, and also <coughs> assisting Indo-Pacific countries to build their resilience, um, enable, to enable them to better 
um, meet the challenges uh, that do exist in the region. And so from that perspective, we really do welcome the opportunity to be here today. Um, Australia, you know, we're a middle power. We depend on a region that's governed by accepted rules and norms. And, you know, we want to have cooperation. We want to be able to trade. Uh, China's our largest trading partner. Uh, the countries of Southeast Asia are not far behind. Um, and we want all countries in our region to be able to thrive um, and um, to have respect for their sovereignty and also for international law. And, you know, we want that to apply to all countries, large and small, so that they can exercise their agency to contribute to regional strategic balance and assist with keeping the peace. And our perspective is that these international rules and norms that have underwritten regional security and prosperity for decades are now under increasing pressure. In fact, we consider that we face the highest level of pressure on those rules since the Second World War. Indeed, even talking about rules sometimes is seen as a Western construct, which um, you know can be challenged on that basis, notwithstanding the you know broad <coughs> engagement in the development of those rules. I'll just quote briefly from Australia's recent defence strategic review, which said about the Indo-Pacific that it faces increasing competition that operates on multiple levels: economic, military, strategic, and diplomatic all interwoven and all framed by an intense contest of values and narratives. We are concerned when countries pursue claims or engage in activities that are inconsistent with international law, as well as unsafe and unprofessional conduct at sea and in the air, including in the South and East China Seas, um, and that obviously endangers safety, security and creates a risk of miscalculation. We're also concerned about increased tensions across the Taiwan Strait. China, as, we, as others have said, continues to modernise its military um, regime at a pace and scale that we have not seen in the world for nearly a century and there is very little transparency or assurance about its strategic intent. As we've just heard, the DPRK continues to destabilise and its ongoing nuclear weapons program and ballistic missile launches threaten its neighbours and the security of our broader region. And as Australia's Foreign Minister has said, we see strategic competition not solely as major powers competing for primacy, but also as a contest over the way our region and our world will work rather than a closed hierarchical region where the rules are dictated by a single major power, we seek an open and inclusive region based on agreed rules. And that's why Australia is stepping up and doing its part to contribute to a strategic equilibrium in the Indo-Pacific. We're helping to maintain the conditions for peace and stability through our diplomacy while playing our part in um, collective deterrence of aggression and coercion. We're investing in a transparent way in our defence capabilities, seeking to ensure that no state concludes that the benefits of conflict outweigh the costs. We are implementing our defence strategic review and delivering on AUKUS. Um, I should say um, AUKUS, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, um, is a, an arrangement between Australia, the US and UK um, in order for Australia to have nuclear-powered submarines. In light of the discussion that we've just heard on um, the public opinion about um, Indigenous nuclear weapons capability in Republic of Korea, I want to make it very clear that there is no such uh, public appetite for nuclear weapons in Australia. Indeed, even the concept of nuclear energy is something that Australia does not have and there's very little appetite to pursue. Um, of course, we do sometimes hear contrary indications um, from certain quarters, but I want to make it absolutely clear 
neither side of Australian politics or government and the population at large has any interest in acquiring nuclear weapons. Um, but we do want to be a more capable security partner in our region. And we're shaping the type of region we want to live in, open, stable and prosperous by harnessing the tools of our national power and responding to the challenging strategic circumstances in the Indo-Pacific by bringing unprecedented coordination and, and ambition to Australia's statecraft. We're deepening our engagement with Southeast Asia and we're committed to ASEAN centrality and ASEAN-led regional architecture where ASEAN-led forums can play a crucial role in reducing the risk of misunderstanding and miscalculation and contribute to regional stability. My last posting was in the Philippines and, you know, I used to say they are at the bleeding edge of the disputed territory in the South China Sea, dealing with contestation and coercion pretty much every single day. Um, and Australia is also enhancing our engagement with the Pacific and supporting the Pacific Islands Forum and strengthening our closest partnerships, including in Europe, along with our alliance with the United States and strategic partnerships with the Republic of Korea, Japan and India. We are complementing and reinforcing the regional architecture through groupings such as the Quad, I'm um, sure most people in this room would know, but the Quad is Australia, the United States, Japan and Korea um, for democracies. Um, no, not Korea, sorry, India. <laughs> for, for democracies um, uh, that are working together um, to support the region um, and deliver genuine benefits through a positive and very practical agenda. On nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament, we consider nuclear risk reduction a vital area of work. Nuclear risks are unfortunately growing in East Asia, while mechanisms to re reduce those risks are um, sorely lacking. We don't have arms control treaties, even dialogue and transparency measures um, do not exist. Australia is working with partners to promote nuclear risk reduction measures through initiatives such as hosting an ASEAN Regional Forum Nuclear Risk Reduction Workshop with the Philippines in March this year. And we're keen to work with other partners, including the EU, to build on this work. Addressing nuclear, regional nuclear proliferation risks is also a priority, particularly the DPRK, and Australia is focused on addressing the threat posed by DPRK's unlawful nuclear weapons program through strict enforcement of sanctions. We've just introduced some new ones in response to latest activities and other measures. And we strictly enforce our UN Security Council resolutions against the DPRK and encourage all countries to do likewise. Um, we're also working, working to strengthen the IAEA safeguard system in the region, for example, through our active role in the Asia-Pacific Safeguards Network and through a $10 million investment in the development of safeguards technology. Should competition in the Indo-Pacific spill into conflict, the consequences for the world would be catastrophic. But conflict isn't inevitable, in our view, and history shows that major powers' competition can and must be managed responsibly. In this regard, recent steps by the US and China to resume high-level dialogue are very much welcome and also um, very early talks on arms control provide some hope, uh, noting, of course, that um, it's still very early days and there's much work to be done. Today's circumstances mean we need to commit anew to building preventative in infrastructure to reduce the risk of crisis, conflict and war by accident. And it's up to all of us to deploy our collective statecraft, influence and networks and capabilities to minimise the risk of misunderstanding and miscalculation to prevent a catastrophic conflict. The desire for peace and stability is seen across the Indo-Pacific and I think we would all be wise to encourage practical steps focused on mutual strategic reassurance, military risk reduction measures and open lines of communication at all levels. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Merci beaucoup, uh, Amanda. Uh, in particular, for giving us uh, this uh, historic sense of the, <laughs> of the pressure that uh, Australia is, uh, 
is under in the region by, uh, by saying that the pressure is possibly the strongest since the Second World War. I think it was very sound. And, and it, it, it really gives us the level of the, of the country uh, preoccupation and country security perception, and of course, as well as a measure of the, uh, of the investment uh, that is being made and that will be made in the future foreseeable in, uh, in, in defense. And I also think that many Europeans uh, here and, and, and later when uh, listening to what you have just said will welcome very much your idea of uh, according to which the, the future of, of Europe is also shaped in the Indo-Pacific region because uh, uh, um, I would say everyone is not still uh, um, already on the same line in, in, in Europe. But you know, you meant uh, India and you mentioned uh, the Republic of Korea and it, it, it reminds me of something. Uh, former uh, Prime Minister Kevin Rudd it was, I think it was a few years ago now, he, he expressed support for an uh, Asian uh, nuclear planning group in which uh, Australia, Japan, the Republic of Korea at that time, and, and, and the US would discuss specific policies uh, associated with US nuclear forces and, and conduct war games and uh, exercises and including those involving uh, participation at, at the highest political level. And uh, maybe we will address this in, in our session when we have time, but I was wondering uh, uh, whether this proposal had, uh, had some echo, at least in the political sphere in, uh, in Australia, because I haven't heard about it for some time. Uh, and of course, I understand that there is no appetite uh, for nuclear even civil in Australia, uh, uh, of course. And, uh, and, now, and now we'll give the floor uh, to you, um, Hideshi Tokushi, and, uh, and you have the floor for 12 to 15 minutes. Thank you. All right. And you have slides. Yes. You do have. It. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, let, uh, first of all, let me thank uh, EU Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Consortium for inviting me to this very important uh, event. I'm very much grateful to all of those people who uh, made my trip to this wonderful city possible. Thank you very much. Um, you know, East Asia, uh, uh, regional security uh, is uh, always uh, uh, fragile. Uh, one of the issues is maritime security because East Asia is a huge seascape. Uh, China's maritime expansion to the South China Sea and to the Indian Ocean and to the uh, Pacific Ocean is destabilizing the entire region. And with this in mind, uh, I'd like to discuss some of the uh, South China Sea issues and to explore the possibility of EU-Japan uh, sec uh, maritime security cooperation. The Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean are hinged by the second largest sea in the world, namely the uh, South China Sea. This fact is very important for Japan as Japan uh, defines uh, itself as a maritime nation in its uh, national security strategy of 2013 and the most recent one of uh, 2022. Main arteries of the world uh, economy are running through the South China Sea and Japan is uh, much dependent on them. Uh, Economy-wise, um, uh, 20, around 23% of crude oil and around 57% uh, of uh, natural gas going through the South China Sea are headed for Japan. Uh, the South China Sea is also important for its fishery resources. Uh, annual catch from this region, I mean the South China Sea, uh, amounts to around 12% of the world uh, total. So it's a main uh, source of food pr uh, protein for the Asians, including uh, the Japanese. And security-wise, uh, you know, all of China's uh, maritime expansion uh, is bound for East Asia. Uh, the South China Sea and uh, East China Sea are main flashpoints. As the South China Sea connects the two oceans, uh, it is important to ensure free uh, flow of military forces between them. And also, the average uh, depth of uh, the South China Sea is more than uh, 1,000 meters. Uh, this fact adds a strategic value uh, to uh, the region because uh, safe, uh, uh, no, 
uh, because it wor uh, works as a safe haven for submarine operations. Now, uh, Japan's position on the South China Sea issues uh, is uh, unambiguous. Uh, Japan promotes a free and open Indo-Pacific, or FOIP, um, uh, with a view to strengthening the rules-based free and open international order. Uh, Japan strongly supports ASEAN outlook on uh, the Indo-Pacific, or AOIP, and trying to generate synergy of uh, AOIP and uh, FOIP. Uh, FOIP uh, is uh, uh, Japan's guiding concept for promoting international security cooperation. And Japan is uh, trying to uh, make this concept more universal uh, uh, with its partners. Japan's Prime Minister uh, Fumio Kishida launched uh, Japan's new uh, yeah, uh, Japan's uh, new plan for this vision in, uh, in India uh, in this March. Uh, it has uh, four points, and the core uh, of the first pillar on the principles and norms is, of course, the rule of law. And the most important pillar in relation to uh, the topic of this session uh, is the fourth one. I mean, uh, safety and security of maritime and airspace. Um, you know, China is fully integrated in the world economy. It is not isolated. It is all, uh, impossible to isolate it. Even cooperation with China uh, is inevitable for any countries, but as it, it is not risk-free, uh, Japan is trying to help uh, vulnerable partner, partners, particularly in East, uh, Southeast Asia, enhance their resilience and strengthen their immunity. It is in Japan's interest as well as in those countries' interest. Here, uh, there is a window of opportunity uh, about uh, the co uh, cooperation between uh, Japan and uh, EU. Now, uh, Japan-US alliance uh, continues to be a pillar of Japan's national security. And this alliance uh, is not simply bilateral anymore. It's part of the uh, US alliance uh, network in this region, together with uh, the uh, you know, US-Australia uh, alliance relationship. And a synergy of the U.S. bilateral alliances in this region and other uh, security partnership is being generated. And Japan, EU, and Japan-NATO partnerships uh, should be enhanced in this con uh, context. Japan and Europe should align their views and policies, including their strategic priorities and resource allocations. Uh, there are uh, a couple of key documents. The first one is... Uh, uh, strategic uh, uh, Partnership Agreement, uh, SPA, uh, between Japan and the EU of uh, 2018. And the second one is Individually Tailored uh, Partnership uh, Program, uh, uh, ITTP, uh, between NATO and Japan for uh, 2023 to 2026. Um, Japan EU SPA identifies numerous items for cooperation uh, as shown in this slide, uh, you know, including WMD and counterterrorism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And Japan <coughs> NATO ITPP uh, identifies uh, 16 specific goals uh, in four priority issues. And these two documents, uh, SPA and ITPP, will work as the guidelines. Uh, for the enhancement of interoperability and their individual resilience. And now, uh, talking about the South China Sea, I would argue for joint uh, efforts to eradicate power vacuum and retrieve balance of power in our advantage in that region. You know, uh, if, you, we, if we look back at the history of this, uh, the South China re uh, Sea region, the China often advanced uh, to the South China uh, Sea region exploiting power vacuum. First, in the 1950s, after the French withdrawal from uh, Indochina, and then in the 1970s, uh, after the uh, American uh, withdrawal from uh, Vietnam, and then uh, in the 1980s, after the uh, Soviets, former Soviets, uh, uh, reducing its military presence in Vietnam, and then in the 1990s, uh, after the uh, U.S. withdrawal from the Philippines. Um, so uh, the, uh, to, uh, it is very important to eradicate the power vacuum. So 
Uh, from this point of view, uh, joint exercises and uh, also more frequent port calls, uh, seaport and airport calls, uh, will be uh, useful and uh, should be increased. But, um, you know, the uh, literal states are very, very vulnerable. If you look at this picture, you know, the large ship is China's Coast Guard ship of 4,400 4, 4, tons. But the, in contrast, uh, the small ship is Indonesia's, uh, you know, uh, naval ship. So the, uh, by this, you know, not only the uh, Chinese PLA, but also China's uh, Coast Guard is intimidating those vulnerable uh, countries. So uh, it is uh, almost uh, also meaningful to, uh, for us to help them uh, acquire enough maritime uh, security and maritime law enforcement capacity. And one of the relevant issues is maritime domain awareness, MDA. Uh, information sharing is the basis of uh, cooperation. Um, you know, today, uh, threats are hybrid. Uh, each part of a hybrid threat may, be, uh, uh, may not be vital. The situation may be uh, pure, uh, pure white at the outset, but uh, it will become uh, uh, closer to pitch black very, very rapidly. Uh, it is uh, important to stay vigilant and to share information even before a sign of a change of color uh, shows up. Uh, for this purpose, uh, Indo-Pacific uh, Partnership uh, for Maritime Domain Awareness, IPMDA, uh, uh, launched by the Quad of uh, US, Japan, Australia, India uh, in May uh, 2022 uh, is noteworthy. Uh, IPMDA will serve uh, 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 ASEAN's immediate needs for maritime security, particularly you know, addressing dark fishing. Uh, uh, they, uh, uh, dark uh, fishing vessels uh, might be maritime militia of uh, China. Uh, coordinated uh, operations of the, those uh, fishing boats and the powerful Coast Guard uh, will uh, create gray zone uh, situations and uh, pressure uh, opponents uh, while avoiding direct military clashes. IPMDA uh, will help build an accurate maritime picture of uh, near real-time activities in partner waters. So cooperation between the Quad and Europe uh, or, the, uh, or you know, kind of in you know, a quad plus, uh, will have to be promoted uh, on this uh, issue as well. So uh, this is uh, one of my you know, uh, you know, recommendations uh, for the future of the uh, Japan-EU or Japan-NATO uh, cooperation. And uh, before uh, you know, concluding my uh, initial remarks, I would like to touch upon a North Korean issue because uh, you know, Professor Kim and uh, Ambassador Gori both uh, mentioned uh, North Korean issue somewhat. Um, you know, North Korean threat is not regional, but uh, already you know, global because it has uh, you know, intercontinental capability or approaching to that level. And also, you know, it is colluding with Russia and supplying weapons to uh, Russia. So it's a global threat, not only a regional threat. And Russia set a very, very bad example uh, in the eyes of North Korea. Uh, there are several reasons. First of all, uh, from the North Korean uh, point of view, uh, Russian blackmail works in order to prevent NATO's uh, direct involvement in that uh, war in Ukraine. And secondly, once uh, you know, uh, uh, a country abandons uh, its uh, nuclear weapon, then it will be uh, uh, under strong uh, pressure and even uh, invaded by uh, uh, you know, nuclear, uh, you know, uh, uh, nuclear weapons country. Uh, just look at uh, Libya or uh, uh, Syria or Iraq. You know, I, I think that's uh, the uh, you know impression uh, posed to uh, North Korea. And thirdly, uh, it is now, uh, now it is very, very uh, difficult and almost impossible uh, for the United Nations Security Council to impose sanctions against uh, North Korea. Uh, so, you know, uh, North Korea uh, acquired these uh, bad lessons uh, from Russia. So we have to, we have to uh, work together uh, in order to address uh, this issue as well. And so I stop here. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Dukushi, also to uh, raise those uh, DPRK nuclear ballistic issues. <clears throat> of
of course, and we have time to come back to this, uh, possibly from uh, our audience, because we have 30 minutes now to open uh, a discussion with our floor. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe I would also have one for you. Well, I, I proposed you to to, to 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 both of you two two things you could address, if you if you wish, on Kevin Roots first perception, let's say, position, proposition, and the national cons and the, the consultative, consultative group. Uh, there is also something, uh, Professor Tokushi, I would like you to, uh, to address if you want and if you have time. The, the national defense strategy of December 2022 uh, detailed as a second approach, not of the first approach, um, the strengthening of the alliance with the United States. The first approach being uh, formally the strengthening of Japan's national defense architecture. And my uh, point is, uh, well, it's, it's schematic, of course, but I would like to go straight to that point. Do you think... The national strategy of what country? The national defense strategy of December of Japan. Japan, of Japan. Yes. Um, I'd like to know... Uh, what you're thinking about uh, Japan making progress, slow progress, strong progress towards strategic autonomy, and how is this uh, articulated to the framework of the American alliance? And I ask this, of course, this is not at all a challenge. It is because the question naturally echoes uh, across Europe. And so I'd like to have your perception on this if you have time and if you wish. And uh, that being said, we can open the floor to uh, our good audience, and we have certainly uh, many um, uh, questions. One from Elizabeth there, uh, a second from, from you, uh, uh, lady. Well, we have many. So we will have a first round of, 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 uh, of questions at the back of, of, the, of the room there, sir, and, 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 and you as the fourth one, okay? And let's take the, the four questions first, and then we'll have time for a second round. Elizabeth first, Elizabeth Sue. Thank you. Yeah, thank you to the panelists. A really, really interesting um, remarks that you shared. I have two quick questions, and I'm Betty Sa. I'm a research fellow at the German Council on Foreign Relations. Um, so one, maybe rather to Dr. Kim, I wanted to ask you, you like beyond strike capabilities being developed by um, North Korea and South Korea, um, there's also a development or several developments of satellite capabilities. Um, and I wanted to ask you, there's some, of course, TPRK launching satellites is uh, violating um, United Nations Security Council resolutions. I understand that, but there are some people saying that both Koreas having their own indigenous satellite capabilities might even have a stabilizing um, effect. If you could uh, reflect on that, that would be great. And the second question, um, thank you, Professor Tokushi, for mentioning the Indo-Pacific Partnership for Maritime Domain Awareness. Um, I wanted to ask you, and maybe also Ambassador Gorley, um, how this was received by regional countries, given that Quad is often seen rather as an anti-China alliance. Thank you. Uh, uh, hello, my name is Darina. I'm from Georgia, and I'm a uh, part of the Young Women in Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Mentorship Program. Um, my question is is related to Taiwan issue and uh, Chinese nuclear arsenal. So I would say maybe I can direct it to Mr. Kim and also Mr. Takuchi if you would like to answer. Um, I wanted to ask uh, um, because Chinese nuclear arsenal is growing, um, do you see that? Do you see it possible that? China might use it uh, in it as a coercive, uh, as a form of coercive leverage um, uh, in the future. Given that uh, when Soviet Union's uh, intercontinental capabilities uh, matured uh, in the Khrushchev years, uh, I mean, it became possible for the Soviet Union to use it as a coerc coercive leverage. How do you see it possible um, for China and maybe Chinese leadership to do that? in the future. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Um, my name is Heinz Gärtner, University of, uh, of Vienna. Um, at the beginning of the century, we had this uh, six-party uh, talks uh, between uh, US, uh, Japan, uh, China, Russia, both South Korea's and the North Korean uh, nuclear program. Ever since, uh, it became a very much a bilateral undertaking between Korea and uh, the US. Uh, my question would be, would it be possible to return to an inclusive a multilateral a format, uh, this time with the inclusion of the European Union and Australia. Uh, after all, uh, the Europeans are concerned uh, that uh, North Korean missiles might uh, target also European uh, citizens. Uh, so the question is, uh, uh, would it be possible to have a new multilateral inclusive format on this uh, issue? Thank you. Um, I'm uh, Chiara Cervasio from uh, uh, BASIC, the British American Security Information Council. Uh, thank you to all the panelists for your um, insightful um, presentations. Uh, my first question would be to uh, Dr. Kim. Um, I don't know if you, if you can answer this, but I was wondering um, what, what has been and what, what is the role of um, the civil society when it comes to uh, nuclear uh, weapons discourse um, in Japan and South Korea. Um, so what is the role um, of NGOs, think tanks, um, and even like activist groups, um, and uh, whether that has an influence on governmental decisions? Um, and then a couple of questions for Ambassador Gorley. Um, so you mentioned that the EU um, is contributing already to, to the Indo-Pacific, so I was wondering um, which kind of contribution uh, is the EU making, um, especially when it comes to uh, non-proliferation and, and disarmament, um, and maybe what more could be done? So um, yesterday we discussed the EU's role as an orchestrator. Um, so can the EU play, uh, in your opinion, this role? as an orchestrator um, in, in multilateral and in promoting sort of multilateralism um, in the region. And then you mentioned also nuclear risk reduction um, as, as a priority, of course, uh, in the Indo-Pacific. So I was wondering, what are Australia's uh, priority when it comes to nuclear risk reduction uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, region? Thank you. Um, hello, good good afternoon, I think. So my name is Carla Pobilina. I'm an associate fellow of APLN. Um, I have two questions and I'll just give it and probably whoever is willing to answer it. The first question is actually, um, there is a perception that actions that supposedly shore up deterrence gaps are often criticized for increasing insecurity. At the same time, it seems inconceivable that states or policy leaders would accept vulnerabilities or aggressive act. What is the optimum balance between minimizing risk and uh, ensuring deterrence? That is my first question. My second question is that, what does the panel think about the US Congress including some funding to continue research and development, open possibilities of future deployment of sea launch cruise missiles? And how do you think that would affect the dynamics in the Indo-Pacific region? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So we have uh, several questions here. Amanda, do you want to start? Oh, thank you very much. Thanks for all the great questions. Um, well, former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd is now the Australian ambassador in the United States. So he is uh, doing a great job there and very um, closely working with the United States government on, on issues like this. Um, he's, he's had a lot of ideas over the course of his illustrious career. Um, and I think... In some ways, the Quad um, is uh, a modern sort of embodiment of, of what he was hinting at. 
Um, and it, actually in Geneva, uh, where Bruce and I are both uh, based, we meet in the disarmament context as the Quad Plus Republic of Korea. So we recognise the the like-mindedness um, between Quad Partners and the Republic of Korea on these issues. And, um, you know, I think that's a, a really important thing. Um, how has um, the Quad been received in, in the region? Well, um, you know, of course, it is sometimes characterised as a, an anti-China body, but it is not intended to be that. It is more um, an association of for democratic countries um, across the region who have a shared interest in um, the strategic stability of the region and who want to do um, practical things within the region to support the countries of the region. Um, it is not a military alliance or anything like that. Um, I'll just go to the question um, the lady over there asked about um, contribute what more the EU can do to contribute to non-proliferation and disarmament in the region. Um, well, I think some of the things um, that have already been mentioned, um, like um, port visits, um, joint exercises in the region, um, just having a, a presence in the region um, is very important. But the EU is also, um, I think, either an observer or a member of the ASEAN Regional Forum. And although that body, um, you know, is, is sometimes questioned, it has actually quite a broad membership, which actually includes DPRK. Um, and, you know, we've been doing some joint work um, within that forum on nuclear risk reduction. And I'm not sure the EU actually participated in the workshop that we co-hosted earlier this year with the Philippines. So I think, you know, participating and contributing um, to those initiatives are is really important. In terms of our risk reduction priorities, I mean, you know, one of the concerns we have is that there isn't a very sophisticated dialogue within the region around the risks that are um, in the region. And when you think about, you know, the fact that there are a number of nuclear weapon states, nuclear possessor states and DPRK in the region, um, for us it's about raising awareness, building um, capacity um, and also, um, you know, trying to increase uh, the normative um, expectation around risk reduction and transparency in nuclear weapons build-up. And also, you know, ideally you would um, encourage practical measures to be put in place to avoid any sort of catastrophic outcome. Thanks. Um, thank you for um, interesting questions. I'll try to uh, address the uh, questions uh, that are directly addressed to me, starting with uh, Benjamin's uh, nuclear consultative group. I actually don't know um, how much it matters because I don't have the insider's information about this. Uh, not sure how much it matters in the short term, but I guess it's in the long run um, probably <coughs> quite useful for South Korea to have. But uh, I think in, in terms of the short term direct impact, I thought that the name mattered a lot. And I think South Koreans uh, care a lot about, um, yeah, in a sense, the prestige element in alliance politics too. And um, the NATO's nuclear planning group name probably was <laughs> there. And then the name of nuclear consultative group, that was already maybe a little bit of a diplomatic uh, victory. Um, the question about the satellite capabilities of North Korea and South Korea, uh, we don't know how capable uh, North Korean satellites are or if they are functioning at all. Um, but I, I guess a lot of people worry more about the capabilities to um, deliver the uh, satellites to the orbit, and which can be then uh, uh, applied to the missile technology. So. Uh, um, I'm not sure about the importance of North Korean satellite capabilities uh, itself at the moment. And I guess 
when it comes to satellite capabilities, we, what we really should be talking about is the US uh, satellite capabilities. It's probably getting quite uh, old by now, uh, but uh, at the end of 2022, when I checked, um, two thirds of operational satellites uh, were uh, US owned. And obviously, um, in terms of military application, US space assets are the best and they make the biggest difference in Ukraine as well. And since the majority of these uh, uh, satellites are uh, American owned, Japanese, South Korean national security, and also European uh, security, these are all affected by any attack on US space assets. So I think allies have some uh, strong reasons to really talk about how to work together to protect the US space assets. And in terms of uh, South Korean satellite uh, um, capabilities, South Korea is a really uh, late comer to this game because of the restrictions on the missile technology. I think only in 2021, the US government really uh, lifted the uh, restrictions on uh, South Korean missile and rocket uh, launching uh, capabilities. So uh, South Korea is really late to the game. It's putting a lot of money and efforts in it, but it's also trying to do too many th things at the same time. And um, obviously in terms of the budget, it's much smaller than that of Japan. And I think the South Koreans should be actually finding a niche and not trying to do everything. And in this context, I think the um, Space Security Corporation agreed at Camp David and then also afterwards uh, discussed, uh, I think in November, I think there was a working group uh, um, among high level officials uh, about space cooperation between these three countries. And I think the findings, some sort of complementary arrangements between these countries would be really crucial to find a good uh, combination of satellite capabilities. Uh, in terms of the China's coercive potential for China's coercive use of nuclear threats, um, I think China for a long time had really, really minim minimalist nuclear uh, posture. And in the 2000s, I even remember how uh, some academics uh, wondered about the US first strike capabilities uh, because uh, Chinese uh, nuclear arsenal was so small and the United States was developing missile defense. And now obviously with the traje trajectory of these uh, much larger um, Chinese nuclear arsenal in mind, it's only natural for us to worry about China's use of nuclear threats. But at the same time, I think we should also remember that the Chinese side must be also very much worried about US threat of nuclear use over Taiwan. President Biden has already at least four times clearly said that uh, the United States will actually militarily intervene and defend Taiwan. And Taiwan is not an ally um, of the United States, but there's a lot at stake. Clear uh, communication was made by the US president and I, I think the Chinese side must be also quite uh, cautious uh, in this regard. And on this point, I think the objective uh, material factors are probably a lot less important than the subjective assessments on the part of um, Chinese policymakers. And we don't have information about that. So uh, unfortunately, we cannot really do anything other than specula speculating on yeah, what they may be thinking. Uh, in terms of uh, the role of civil society in Japan and South Korea, in Japan, definitely very strong uh, anti-nuclear norms are there in the public. By the way, I'm a uh, Belgian citizens, but uh, Belgian citizen, but I am an ethnic Korean, and I grew up in Japan, and so I, I, the strong anti-nuclear norms are yeah really in my brain. I mean, little children watch animation films about how people burnt in the nuclear you know attack. So uh, that kind of thing matters a lot, and I think a lot of Japanese people really have these uh, strong anti-nuclear sentiments, and. So civil organizations also have strong influence. Having said that, they are getting older. And now the survivors of nuclear attacks, I think they are becoming fewer and fewer. So with the generational change, I don't know how strong this will remain. Uh, in South Korea, 
Um, regardless of the political spectrum, I think the public is actually quite supportive of nuclear weapons. So uh, it changes over time, but I think it's just because of the um, leader's position on these nuclear options. So when the conservative Yun President Yun Sun Yai advocates for stronger nuclear yeah, option for South Korea, then that pushes the liberal voters or liberal uh, citizens away from that kind of opinion. And when the conservative uh, leader says that the Washington Declaration reduces the need for an independent nuclear arsenal on the part of South Korea, among the cons conservative South Korean citizens, then the support for an independent nuclear arsenal decreases and so on. So the public opinion uh, changes a lot uh, by these uh, leaders' cues and also um, the results are also um, yeah, very much um, affected by how the questions are asked. So uh, uh, public opinions matter definitely, but I, I, I don't know how solid they are. And having said that, based on these things, the civil society's anti-nuclear role in South Korea is much, much weaker than in Japan. I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you very much for being very specific. Don't think that's great. Please. All right. Um, first of all, I'd like to respond to Benjamin's uh, you know, comment. Well, um, you know, the uh, Japan's uh, national security strategy and uh, Japan's national defense strategy, both of these documents have uh, three uh, pillars. One is self-help, of course. And the second pillar is Japan-US alliance relationship. And third pillar is international security cooperation with other like-minded countries or you know, organizations like EU, NATO, Australia, India, et cetera, et cetera. And the, you know, when uh, NATO Secretary General uh, you know, visited Japan in uh, this uh, February or uh, late January, he said in Tokyo that the, uh, the security of Europe is, uh, you know, deeply connected to the security of East Asia, and that's right. And also, you know, similarly, uh, Japan's Prime Minister uh, Fumio Kishida often said that uh, Ukraine today might be, uh, you know, uh, East Asia tomorrow. So the, there is no such thing as, uh, you know, security for Europe alone or peace uh, for East Asia alone. So. That's why uh, Japan uh, uh, emphasizes uh, the partnership, security partnerships with uh, other like-minded countries, including the United States. So uh, Japan depends on the uh, uh, alliance relationship with the United States, but it doesn't mean that Japan depends on the United States. You know, de Japan depends on cooperation with uh, the, uh, uh, the United States. Japan defends itself. The Japan-U.S. alliance is just a means of uh, the, uh, I mean, the tools of defending Japan's uh, own security. And so it, Japan is not autonomous in a sense. And Japan doesn't want to be autonomous in a sense. Well, um, anyway, that's my first point. And second point is uh, about the IPMDA or the uh, Quad. Um, you know, there are some people uh, who argue that uh, the Quad is an uh, anti-China coalition. Well, in a sense, it is so. But uh, Japan or the Quad countries do not want um, you know, other countries, particularly fragile Southeast Asian countries, to uh, choose between uh, our side and China side. You know, Jap actually, you know, Southeast Asian countries do not want to put into that kind of you know, uh, bind, uh, 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 position uh, to have to uh, make a binary choice, uh, you know. Uh, but uh, as I said in my initial remarks, uh, you know, cooperation or you know, partnership with China is not risk-free. Free. Therefore, uh, those weaker states must have enough resilience. Uh, so uh, we are helping those uh, fragile countries to acquire uh, enough uh, capability to resist China's pressure. If they have uh, those capabilities, uh, they can. Uh, is, uh, uh, you know, uh, cooperate or partnership with uh, those uh, countries more easily. So that's uh, the, uh, the intention of the Quad. And thirdly, 
I'd like to discuss somewhat about Taiwan issue. Um, as uh, Professor uh, Kim said, um, you know, I, I mostly agree with uh, Professor Kim. Um, you know, the, uh, Jap uh, the U.S. nuclear umbrella uh, towards Japan and towards South Korea, that's pretty sure. And al already, you know, South Korea and Japan has been talking with the United States in order to strengthen the nuclear umbrella. But the, uh, the, it is not sure whether Taiwan is under the nu uh, U.S. nuclear umbrella. And uh, the Taiwan, uh, the U.S. commitment to Taiwan is still, you know, ambiguous, although it is uh, less and less un un uh, ambiguous. But still, you know, Taiwan is not a treaty ally of the United States. And instead, uh, the, in contrast, uh, uh, China doesn't uh, abandon uh, Taiwan. It's, uh, uh, Taiwan is uh, the, uh, one of the core interests of uh, Taiwan, I'm sorry, China. And uh, China doesn't uh, deny the possibility of use uh, for, to use force against Taiwan once uh, Taiwan goes independent. So uh, there is a possibility that uh, China might use any weapons uh, once uh, uh, war, a conflict broke out, breaks out uh, over the Taiwan Strait. So we have to keep vigilant and we have to prepare uh, in order to you know, retrieve uh, balance of power uh, in our advantage. And uh, you know, the six party talk, yes, that's important because the North Korean issue is not uh, you know, bilateral issue between North Korea or South Korea or the North Korea and the United States. It is an issue between uh, North Korea and the entire international community. So therefore, uh, the uh, multilateral uh, approach is very, very important. But at this moment, I do not uh, think that uh, it is uh, realistic to have North Korea in that kind of uh, no, dialogue because it, uh, already uh, North Korea uh, uh, denies uh, its commitment to denuclearize, although uh, it uh, made a strong, uh, you know, clear uh, commitment to denuclearization in 2018. And finally, I would like to talk a little bit about Japan's possibility of nuclearization. Uh, not only, uh, you know, uh, Japanese national sentiment, but also uh, Japan's strategic position is very, very important. Japan doesn't have any strategic depth uh, to absorb uh, nuclear attacks. And uh, also, you know, the uh, Jap the Japanese uh, uh, public and Japanese politicians know that once Japan goes nuclear, then uh, it will invite other countries to nu uh, nuclearize it, uh, themselves, you know, uh, South Korea or other countries. And once uh, the uh, pro uh, proliferation is made, uh, the uh, effect of uh, uh, deterrence will be diluted. And also, um, you know, Japan will uh, face a strong uh, international sanctions, not only from the United States, but also from the uh, EU as well, and even China and Russia as well. So, um, you know, uh, it is not a wise, wise option uh, for Japan to go nuclear, and Japan knows it. Uh, okay, so we can have another round of questions pretty fast if possible, and then we close. Uh, Ambassador Kreza first, then you, madame. Uh, do we have other questions? Yes, please, first, and you then, and I think we'll close, okay? The four of you. Uh, beginning, please. And then, and then. Thank you. I'm Margareta Kinen Ellen from Board of Basel Peace Office uh, Switzerland, having lived and worked also three years in the Philippines for International Commission of Jurists. Mm. Um, <coughs> uh, my concern is, after hearing all this, where are the de-escalating forces within Asia? I think as Europeans, we can only ask questions and not give recipes after what has been happened on the European side in the last 
20 years. <laughs> and uh, where uh, and how is the priority to reach SDGs uh, driven by the Asian, by the major Asian countries? I'm addressing SDG goal 16 for peaceful and inclusive societies. Also, the SDG goal for climate action, knowing that uh, many Pacific islands are totally threatened to, to disappear. I mean, all I hear is just this trend to have the two blocks from which Europe has suffered in the past and is suffering again today. Where are the peace-oriented, peace-building, de-escalating forces? Because I have high respect for the wisdom and the experience of Asian societies. And so I wish uh, to have an interesting answer from, pro from the both professors. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Carlo Trezza from Italy. Um, uh, we are in a European environment, uh, and it, it's a little bit a pity that Gudrun Wagner could not come to <laughs> and uh, to, to to express uh, a European view. I personally uh, can only indicate what are my personal my personal opinion, and that is that uh, there is a certain a, a sure uh, into interdependence uh, in the industrial, trade, uh, uh, cultural field between uh, Europe uh, and Asia, uh, East Asia. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that Europe is more involved in the cooperative uh, sector than in the confrontational sector. We cannot allow, I think, realistically to be involved uh, militarily in, uh, in, in uh, East Asia. So the support can be fundamentally of a political nature. And there, yes, we, we are doing what we can. Uh, starting with uh, you know, DPRK, the Benjamin mentioned uh, the Kedo uh, president, which indeed was a failure, but it was a failure not because it was a, such a bad idea, but because it was sunk by the, by the Bush administration fundamentally. So uh, yes, the idea of uh, putting uh, nuclear power plants uh, in North Korea was rather courageous, but I think it was made within the idea of the prospect of a possible unification of the two Koreas. Then it made sense. Anyway, uh, what, uh, uh, so, uh, so this is how I see the relations between, uh, between the two areas. Uh, I don't hear very much, uh, and we didn't hear much, uh, about ASEM, the Asia, Europe uh, meeting uh, structure, which at my times when I was ambassador to Korea was uh, was a major a major development, major uh, instrument of of cooperation, and also another <laughs> remark that I want to say: uh, China and uh, uh, Russia uh, until now had uh, respected and uh, approved. Uh, sanctions against the DPRK. I think that today they would not do it anymore and probably they are not implementing as they did in the past the sanctions uh, against uh, the DPRK. So there's a major change in this, in this sense. Thank you. Unfortunately, I think we'll stop here because we really have no time for two other questions, but we have time for answers, definitely. So please, Ambassador, first, if you want to answer, and, and then Professor, and then uh, you, Tongfi. Thank you, and then we close. Thanks very much. Um, so what are the de-escalating forces? I mean, I have to say, you know, it's a fairly... Um, 
<laughs> bleak picture at times um, globally in terms of um, de-escalation. But I do think um, the Asia-Pacific region has some very important regional architecture in place where all countries, including China and often Russia, the United States, come together and meet on an annual basis, the East Asia Summit, um, ASEAN Plus meetings, APEC meetings, which have just taken place. Um, all of those forums provide, a, you know, a bit of an opportunity to, for leaders to, to talk about these issues. And then, of course, bilateral um, issues, uh, bilateral forums are also really important, um, and particularly at the moment, the recently re-established US-China um, leader-level talks. Um, also for Australia, I mean, we've had um, about seven years of um, no high-level meetings between Australia and China um, and trade sanctions as well. Um, so we understand what it's like to be essentially pressured by China because it didn't like some of our domestic policies, internal policies, um, around foreign interference. We have recently re-established leader-level um, engagement with China. Our Prime Minister last month visited and he was the first head of state from Australia to visit, or head of government from Australia to visit in seven years. So, you know, China does want to engage. It does want to um, have relationships with countries in the region, um, including Australia. And we have to use those opportunities um, where we can. And Australia has said we want a stable, strong, mutually beneficial relationship with China, but we will speak out when we have to, when we disagree with some actions that China is taking. So we're not prepared to accept a relationship that is entirely on one country's terms. It's a relationship of two sovereign countries. And we hope that sits as an example to others in the region as well. Well, uh, I do not have much to add uh, to uh, Ambassador Gouli's point, but uh, you know, <clears throat> the uh, Indo-Pacific region, particularly East Asia, has uh, a wide variety of challenges, traditional challenges uh, you know, among the sovereign states and also non-traditional challenges. Uh, as already someone mentioned, you know, the climate change uh, causes a huge impact on that region, not only you know, sea level rise, but also you know, more powerful uh, you know, uh, natural disasters like you know, typhoons and heavy rainfalls, and or even apart from uh, the uh, climate change issues, uh, you know, that region has uh, potential uh, or a, a possibility of huge uh, earthquake and tsunamis, always. So, uh, you know, in order to address uh, traditional issues, we have to uh, think about, uh, you, know, uh, you know, power balancing. But uh, in order to address non-traditional issues, we have to cooperate with each other, even with, you know, uh, adversaries. But it is becoming very, very difficult because of the uh, major power rivalry, and East Asia is uh, you know, the uh, front line of the major power rivalry, particularly Japan's position and South Korea's position. It, it is uh, quite, you know, they are, those two countries at the forefront front of the major power rivalry. But um, um, at the same time, you know, as uh, you know, Ambassador Goli uh, uh, mentioned, uh, there are a variety of uh, smaller networks in that region, you know, U.S.-centered alliance relationship and the ASEAN-based uh, frameworks like, you know, AF or ADMM and ADMM Plus. You know, in the past they were just, you know, talking shops, mm -hmm. but now uh, they are more, you know, operational. So, you know, the uh, the our challenge is to network those smaller networks uh, in order to create synergy. And so, of course, you know, AUKUS and, um, you know, Quad and Quad Plus and even, you know, FP, FPDA, Five Plus Defense Arrangement, those things must be, uh, you know, uh, put together in order to, uh, you know, uh, create synergy. And, uh, yeah. So, you know, the, uh, and also, you know, as I said, uh, again and again, you know, capacity building support to uh, fragile states in the Southeast Asia, the uh, Pacific Island nations, and the 
uh, you know, the uh, Indian Ocean. That's very, very important as the basis of you know, de-escalation. Um, regarding uh, where are the de-escalating force, um, I have one word answer and three words answer, and I'm a bit worried that both of these answers are becoming less and less uh, reliable. The one word answer is um, money. And the three word answer comes from the title of a foreign affairs article written by Richard Katz in 2013. That was a mutually assured production. And that was how the, the supplies uh, chain interdependence between China and Japan, how that de-escalates the conflictual dynamic between the two countries. And I believe that these still matter but we are also headed to the world of yeah, more and more um, supply chain, I guess not decoupling, but de-risking uh, uh, world. And also uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping doesn't seem to prioritize pros prosperity for the sake of prosperity. He would probably care a lot about economic growth, for example, for the political stability, but it's clear that he is willing to sacrifice economic prosperity for other political goals. So these economic forces, I think, are still important de-escalating forces, but I don't know how much difference it can make once someone decides to take a, a lot more escalatory um, yeah, approach. And I think that general deterrence is really important once, for example, China starts to threaten Taiwan and starts mobilizing and so on, I don't think uh, immediate deterrence to stop China with economic sanctions or threat of that will not work. But it's important to communicate to China what could happen in peacetime at the general deterrence stage. And for that, I think the Countries across the world can work together. Europeans, Asians, they can all work together. And the war um, with Russia was already affecting everyone's lives. And if China and the United States, the two largest economies, start fighting a war, I think the economic consequences would be much, much harder. But at the same time, we need to also communicate to the Chinese leaders that it will be so much worse for the Chinese people. And consequently, the Chinese leaders would also have problems with that. And we need to communicate that in a very friendly and diplomatic manner, I think. Thank you. Thank you for the strong message. Thank you for the three precious speakers. And thank you for a very active uh, participation uh, from the audience. Thank you very much.